All right, well, welcome back to the channel. Uh, this is another uh, episode, the next episode, next lesson of New Thirst Addiction Ministries One Step to Freedom Addiction Recovery Program. Uh, this is a faith based uh, program, uh, a faith based recovery program. Um, it believes, we believe that there is one step to uh, freedom from recovery, and it's not based on anything that we can do, and it's based on God and accepting Him as, um, as our Savior in life. Um, there is uh, uh, scripture in every single lesson. Uh, there's a lot of scripture in every single lesson. And um, in essence, it is essentially just a Bible study. So if you are struggling with addiction, no matter what it is, or if you're just, um, you know, having a, a time in your life where, you know, if you feel like something is missing and you don't know what it is, or if you're going through a, a time of depression or anxiety or whatever the case may be, don't let the words addiction or recovery scare you off from this because it is it's just like I said essentially a Bible study and the goal is leading us to um, to Jesus to the cross that is uh, it's the gospel um, and it is the only way uh, to truly become free and to break the bondage of um, of our addictions uh, it's not a replacement uh, and like a lot of addiction programs talk about, um, you know, or like a lot of addiction programs are the 12 step programs, they're um, replacements to whatever it was that you were addicted to. Um, you know, if you were an alcoholic, if you had an alcohol addiction, you would go to AA every single day of the week for the rest of your life as opposed to drinking. And so it's just kind of replacement and it's really putting a, um, a band-aid on a broken bone is what it is. It's not fixing the problem. It's just kind of masking it, uh, taking some Tylenol for some cancer or something like that. So faith-based program, if you're new to this, we're in chapter three. So hit that subscribe button and that way you'll know when uh, new uh, lessons come out. I try to put them out every Sunday. I'm a day late this time. I was going to record this last night, but um, um, the prayer meeting at the church is only supposed to go from six to seven and it went from like six to nine so by the time i got home it was time for bed um so we're a day late but i try to get those out on sundays um as frequently as i can and then update on the website www.soberforchrist.com uh, you can find uh links to the videos on there you can find uh pdf files for uh, the curriculum. Uh, these PowerPoints are taken straight off of the curriculum. Uh, the curriculum was um, created by the Calvary Chapel Church Association and um, it's the same program that uh, the church that I attend now and the church that I attended before I moved uh, use. Um, so anyway, let's get started. So we're in chapter three. Um, this uh, chapter is called forgiveness we're in chapter three lesson three um <clears throat> talking about turning away from sins chapter one of i'm sorry lesson one of this chapter was seeking god's help and we've touched on seeking god's help throughout the whole um course so far um but we're kind of getting into a little bit more in depth uh, than we did in chapter one or chapter two um in chapter two was uh, talking about confession of sins and how uh, what the importance of that is. <laughs> and so today we're talking about turning away from sins. Um, Matthew chapter five, six says, blessed are those who hunger <clears throat> and those who thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled. So if you hunger and you thirst for righteousness, you will be filled with righteousness. You will be filled with the Holy Spirit. So what is repentance? So if, if we go back real quick, uh, it says turning away from sin. That is what repentance means. Repentance means to to turn away from uh, something that you did. You know, a lot of people are under the impression that, well, I can just say that I'm a Christian and I can just go about and do whatever I want. But that's not really how it works because if you have a true encounter with the Holy Spirit um, and you're trusting in God to lead your life and to, you know, cure you from uh, your addiction, uh, you know, in the context of this program, um, we can't do the things that we want to do. You won't even have a desire to do the things that you want to do because they're contrary to what God tells us to do. God tells us to follow his commands, not do whatever we want. Um, that would be just a, uh, um, a blind, pointless um, 
statement of, of faith or belief if you have no intent of doing whatever you want. So repentance, which is talked about in the Bible, is, uh, is turning away from our sins. So what we want to do is we want to turn from our sins. Every day as believers in Christ, we wrestle with controlling our sinful nature. Every day. Uh, life doesn't necessarily get easier when you're following God, um, like a lot of people think that it does. But in fact, it <coughs> does it get harder um, because Satan is going to constantly attack us and make us feel useless. He's going to give us condemnation. Uh, the conviction comes from the Holy Spirit, but the condemnation, the feeling of, oh, well, I'm just useless today or, you know, I messed up again, whatever, that comes from Satan. Um, but we struggle with controlling our sinful nature because there's still temptations out there. We're still human beings. We still have these fleshly bodies, and it's uh, it's our nature, um, it's our sin nature to want to follow the flesh and do what we want or what feels good now and not what follows God. So every day we wrestle with controlling our sinful nature. And this is why we need, uh, uh, this is why the need for ongoing confession is so important. We need to ask God to show us our sin nature and then ask uh, for his help to turn away from our sins. Um, God doesn't lead us into temptation. Satan does. But God will give us a way out of our temptation uh, with the temptation who will provide us a way out. There's no temptation that has overtaken us uh, that is common or that is uncommon to man. With the temptation, he will provide a way of escape that we may be able to bear it. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Um, God doesn't tempt us, but we need to be constantly talking to him um, and in confession of sins and asking for his help to turn away from our sins and he will provide when we have sin, not only do we confess our sins, but more importantly, we need to stop doing sinful things. Uh, this is called repentance. True repentance results in a change in our attitude and behavior. Uh, it works itself out practically as we turn away from sin and desire to turn to God, seeking his righteousness instead of uh, the former life of sin. Repentance is to turn away from. So we're turning away from all of the things that we used to do that are sinful and contrary to God and his nature. And we are turning to a life of righteousness. Um, and we're seeking God and his righteousness to be imputed, imputed into our lives. Um, and we're not seeking our former life, which... Uh, is difficult. Like I said, we, we're still going to sin. There's still going to be temptations, but we don't have to indulge in those temptations anymore. Uh, we are, we're free. We're broken the, broken the chains of bondage. So what we're going to do here is we're going to, I believe there's three of these in this lesson. We're going to read, um, passage of scripture and then we're going to go through and answer and explain some questions um, related to what we read in uh, these passages um, now again like i said the uh, pdf files for this are on the website so you can go to the website you can print these out and that way you can actually follow along and, and answer the questions for yourself and then that way you have um, you know, something to study on throughout the week, something that you, you know, you don't have to be on YouTube or something like that, something that you can just look at and reference. Um, so we're going to be uh, in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Uh, that's our first passage, and it says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Jesus Christ is our advocate with the Father. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now by this we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, he who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. <clears throat> he who says he abides in him ought to himself also to walk <clears throat> Ought himself also, that says out, but it's supposed to be ought, ought himself also to walk just as he walks. So let's go look at the questions. Um, as believers in Christ, what happens when we sin? We find this in verse 1, uh, which says, My little children, these things are right to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate uh, with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So uh, what happens when we sin? We have an advocate. We have um, someone uh, to intercede on our behalf with God. We have 
the Son interceding with the Father. Um, verse 2 says, uh, And he himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So what is Jesus to those who believe in him? He is the propitiation. He is our advocate. Um, he is our intercessor. Uh, sorry. So, uh, yeah, so Jesus is the propitiation. He is the intercessor for God. Now, word pro, uh, propitiation uh, means that he is able to um, basically appease God, satisfy God for our sins. And that satisfaction, that appeasing comes from the cross uh, because Jesus took uh, all of our sins and died for our sins so that we would be able to live, so that we can live. Um, and as such, that uh, the, the righteousness then that we have from the blood of the cross uh, appeases God. Otherwise, without that righteousness, without that forgiveness of sin, without that atonement for our sin on the cross, we would not ever be able to do anything to appease um, God. We have to have our uh, the atonement for our sins from the blood of the cross. So how can we be sure that we know God? Now by this we know, this is verse 3, now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. If we keep his commandments, if we have a desire to know him, the spirit will be in us and that is how we know that we know God. Because people don't want to follow the commandments of God. People that follow the commandments of God essentially have to be filled with, uh, with the Holy Spirit. Um, because as men, although there are people who do quote unquote good, um, even though the scripture says that there are none good, um, we have people that say that we're quote unquote good, maybe because we haven't committed murder or um, something to that effect, something horrible. We always think of like horrible things. Um, but the scripture says that if you've lied even once, you are therefore a liar. And um, that lie deserves the punishment, um, the wrath of God, the punishment, which would be an eternity in hell, but we have the blood of the sin. We need atonement for that sin. Um, if you have ever had hate in your heart for a man, then God considers that murder. And if you've ever lusted after a, uh, a woman, then God considers that um, adultery. If you've ever coveted or, you know, lusted or wanted after something that, uh, that wasn't yours, you know, uh, we always usually think of something uh, um, of possessions or of money. You know, you want somebody else's money, you want somebody else's house, their car, the boat, the jet skis, or something like that that they have, um, that is covetousness. And having done any of those things in our lives makes us, um, you know, a, a, a liar, uh, an adulterer, a fornicator, and a murderer at heart. Just by even thinking these things, that is uh, a sin in God's eyes. And so to keep these commandments, and like I said, even though we're not perfect and we're still going to, uh, make mistakes and sin. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we know that we know him by keeping these commandments because these things will, as we get filled with the Holy Spirit, we'll have less of a desire to do these things, to um, participate in these things, one would say. So, what do you become if you claim to know God but don't obey his word? Uh, this is verse 4. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. So if you say that you um, know God, but you don't follow his commandments, then you're a liar. Um, if you say that you have never sinned, you are a liar because the Bible says that all have sinned. Um, so in doing so, in, in just making the claim that you've never sinned before, um, would be considered a sin and the truth is not in you uh, simply for that it's question number five which is still in verse four um, what is a person lacking the per a person is lacking the truth if a person claims that they know god but do not know god then that person is lacking the truth and the truth can be found all of the truth can be found in uh, god's word 
<clears throat> uh, verse number five says, uh, but whoever keeps his word, truly love the, uh, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this, we know that we are in him. How can you know that you are in God's love? Uh, by keeping his word. And then his, uh, his love will be perfected uh, in us. And that is how we know that we are in him with, by having his love. We keep his word and then his love will be in, uh, inputted into us. So if we claim to know and abide in Jesus, what should we do? He who says he abides in him, this is uh, verse 6 um, in First John. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. So uh, that's what we should do. If we claim that uh, we know and abide in Jesus and that he in us, we ought to walk the way that he did. Loving one another, that is... Uh, the, one of the greatest commands is to love one, a neighbor, uh, one, love one another, uh, love your neighbor as yourself, and uh, to love God the Father. Um, so we ought to act like he did. Um, some people will argue, you know, that he was a sinner because he was angry in the temple. Um, no, he had every right to be angry in the temple because that was being used um, for greed, um, for extortion. And uh, it has no place in his father's house. Jesus was a loving, caring person, so loving that he gave his life for us. Without the blood of the cross, and, with, and more importantly, without the resurrection, we would not have any chance um, at salvation. We would have nothing to atone for our sins because our works are nothing in God's eyes. There's no amount of good works that we can have. The way to um, have that atonement for our sins is through the blood of the cross and the resurrection. No other way. There's nothing else that we can do. <clears throat> Jesus died for our sins so that we could follow his example and live for him. He uh, does not forgive our sins so we can just go on sinning repeatedly over and over. Rather, he desires for us to love him instead of loving sin and serve him instead of serving our sinful nature. This is how we turn away from sin. We turn away from sin by serving him and by loving him. If we serve him and we love him, then there will be no room in our hearts or in our lives uh, for the sinful things that we used to do, the, the things that we used to participate in. Um, you know, we talked about this back in um, chapter 1, um, we talked about the importance of having, you know, daily devotion and uh, even even in the first lesson of chapter one, the first lesson of this whole entire program, we talked about how it's important to get into church and to um, build relationships with people in the church and to serve God in the church, to, uh, be involved in prayer and be involved in you know, Bible study and reading and other activities within the church and to love God. And when we love God, we will do works. It's not our works that we want to do and it's not works that save us, but we will, we will produce fruit essentially um, from loving God. And that is how we turn away from sin. We fill our life with God, we fill our mind with God and we will turn away from sin. All right, the uh, next set of scripture that we're going to look at with a couple of questions after it uh, is Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 30. Starting in verse 26, it says, For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for our sins, <clears throat> but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 30. <clears throat> so if we receive the knowledge of truth, uh, which is Jesus, um, remember that in, uh, in John, uh, John chapter 1, verse 1, um, 
that uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was uh, with God, and the Word was God. Uh, Jesus is the Word, um, and Jesus uh, is the truth, as such being that, that uh, God's Word is uh, the truth. Jesus is the truth. So, if we receive the knowledge of Jesus and continue to sin willfully, what happens? Well, uh, for if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for our sins. Um, we cannot continue living the same sinful lifestyle that we once lived in. Or the sacrifice that was Jesus on the cross, the uh, blood of the cross and the resurrection, that is uh, essentially null and void so long as we continue living in, um, in our sin. What three things happen when we sin willfully? Um, how, of how much uh, worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Counted the blood of the covenant, so we've, we uh, have trampled God. We've counted the blood of the covenant by which you sanctified a common thing. Um, basically, we're just saying that it, it was, you know, it, it was, essentially it was for nothing. So we've trampled God. The blood of the covenant, the blood of, of the cross is considered a common thing um, that doesn't really mean anything. And we have insulted the spirit of grace. Those three things uh, are what we do when we happen or what happened when we sin willfully. Oh, man, the coughs and the sneezes tonight. Everyone is accountable to God. However, for believers, there's an increased accountability. In fact, um, if you look in, um, well, I don't want to lie. I don't remember exactly where it is. I think it's in uh, Timothy, but um, I could be wrong on that. But as a pastor or a bishop, you are going to be held responsible twice for your actions and then for uh, how you lead the church. But we have an increased accountability because we have an increased responsibility to share God's word. It's kind of like if you're, uh, you know, you work for the fire department, um, you have a responsibility to, you know, when you're when you're driving around town in the fire truck, if you see a house that's on fire and somebody hanging out of the window, um, and because they can't get out, you have a responsibility to to stop and help them. Uh, this is essentially the same thing. Um, the world. Are people hanging out of the burning building uh, with no hope or no way of escape? And it's our job to, as Christians, as believers, as followers, to share um, the gospel. In fact, in Matthew, the very last verses of the book of Matthew, we are called to go into um, all of the world, go and make disciples of all the world. It's the um, Great Commission. So believers uh, have an increased accountability. God has saved us and forgiven us of all of our unrighteousness, having revealed himself and his will to us. He justifiably expects <clears throat> us to be obedient to his will in our life and turn away from sin. Um, that's only reasonable, right? Like it would be an insult if you got somebody, if you, if you went and bonded somebody out of jail, if you paid their bond, and they went out and um, did the same thing over again and broke the law before they even had a chance to go to court. This is kind of the same thing. God has paid our penalty, um, not even just bonding out of jail. He's paid the fine that, or the penalty, the punishment, the jail sentence that we would have had. And it's insulting and a slap in the face um, to God to willfully disobey him. We all do it. I am guilty of it myself, willfully disobeying him. But he's justified in his uh, expectation uh, for us to be obedient to his will and to his will and not our will. He expects us to turn away from sin. Uh, Psalm 119 verses 9 through 11 say, How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. It's by, by taking heed and listening to God's word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. 
Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. So how can a young man cleanse his way? By heeding and following God's word. And this is um, repeated multiple times throughout the Bible. You can find this in, uh, in the book of Joshua in the very first chapter where Joshua says that he will, uh, or I'm sorry, God's giving Joshua a command to meditate on his word day and night so that it will not um, flee from, it from his lips. It will not go depart from his lips, um, that he won't forget it because uh, Joshua is getting ready to take the children of Israel um, into uh, the promised land. And um, God says, meditate on my word day and night. Go and do what I tell you to do. Go in and um, you know, utterly destroy everyone, wipe everyone out because they're sinful. Do not follow their um, sinful cultures. Do not worship their gods. That's why God wanted them destroyed uh, was because of some of the evil things that they were doing. And it, it's, um, it goes beyond what a lot of people think. But um, when you look at a lot of the gods that were being worshipped in, as Joshua was going in, um, there was Molech, which is uh, the um, god of prosperity, and people would burn their babies. They would put their children through the fire in the arms of this outstretched um, statue. They would heat it up and sacrifice their babies um, for uh, the hopes of prosperity, which is very similar, um, almost identical minus the statue and the burning of a live of babies uh, to abortion today. But that's another, um, that's another topic for another day. But God, or, uh, told, yeah, God told Joshua to keep and meditate on his word so that they didn't fall the same way that the, the Israelites wouldn't fall the same way that they fell multiple times, time and time and time again, um, in their 40 year wandering through the wilderness before entering into the promised land. So, um, a young man can cleanse his way by heeding, uh, uh, the word of God. And how should we seek the Lord with our whole heart, um, with all of our soul. That is how we should seek God, not just, you know, on Sundays for the one hour and then forget about him for the rest of the week. We need to seek him with our whole heart, with our whole mind, and everything that we do all day long, every day. If we have God in our heart, if we have God in our mind, we're not going to have room for any of the sinful thoughts or um, temptations that come in. Keep God's uh, will and his commands at the forefront of your mind. Keep his word on your lips. What can we hide in our hearts to keep us from sinning? the word, um, the Bible, the scriptures, we can take God's word, what he has written in his book and, um, keep that in our heart. And that is what will help to keep us from sinning. The more that we're in God's word, the more that we know and study God's word and not just sit down and read it for, you know, the 15 minutes a day to do the Bible reading in the year, sit down and actually study and do devotion with our word, uh, which is again, some stuff that we talked about way back in the, in the very beginning of this. Um, the more that we do that, uh, <clears throat> the more that we have God's word hidden in our heart, the less desire that we're going to have in our heart to sin. There's not going to be any room for it. There's not going to be any desire for it. The more we study God's word and apply it to our lives, the less likely we are to sin against God. Remember, faith comes by hearing the word of God. This is in Romans chapter 10, 17. As we study God's word, he builds us up in our faith and this helps us to turn away from sin. Now, if you're just reading the word, um, you're just reading the words on a page. If you study it and apply it, um, you can see how, and I, I don't know how many times I read the Bible before, it actually all clicked, you know, I wasn't paying attention to it. That's because I was just reading it and I was, you know, just kind of going through the motions for a long period of time in my life. But the whole Bible points from the beginning to the end points to Jesus. All of it, the whole Bible points to Jesus. Um, we see hints of Jesus in the first chapter of Genesis talking about uh, the first and second chapters when we're talking about um, um, when God said, let's make man in our image. Um, there's hints of the Trinity, God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit there. Um, and then 
all the way through the Old Testament, everything points to Jesus, to the cross. It's following um, the line of David through the Old Testament up to the Immaculate Conception and the birth and then the death and resurrection um, of Jesus. And then even all the way through that to the end, to the book of Revelation, is... Um, that all points to Jesus as well, to the second coming, to the establishing of his kingdom on earth. Um, the whole Bible points to Jesus. And if we just read it, then, you know, uh, what is common to be said these days is, oh, it's a book of fairy tales. Um, and I say that sarcastically because I mean it sarcastically, um, because the people that say that have never read it, uh, never actually read it. And they're just denying it without knowing what it actually says. If you actually study it and read what it says, and follow it and do just any amount of research, you will realize that it is a book, a historical document that is full of facts and truth. And it is no different than our history books, except for that it's more accurate than our history books because we try to erase history. Um, but if we study God's word and uh, we keep his word in our minds, that is how God is going to build our faith and he's going to help us to turn away from sin. And it, I mean, you can see it. Um, you can see how many times in the Old Testament that the Israelites slapped God in the face um, by breaking his commandments. I mean, Moses came down from the, the mountain and the, they were um, they had they had made a bronze calf and they were worshiping it while they were getting the commandments from God. While Moses was getting the commandments from God. They were worshiping the, the bronze calf. Um, and this happened time and time again. There was grumbling against Moses and Aaron throughout the, the whole thing. Like, what made, who made you in charge? We'd be better off if we were in Egypt still. We should just go back to Egypt. Um, you know, at least we had food there. Lots of grumbling, lots of complaining, lots of slapping God in the face. Could be, even though God has always been faithful to fulfill his, um, his covenants with his people, even to this day. He's still faithful to maintain those those covenants, to fulfill those covenants. But if we keep God's word at the forefront of our mind, it will erase that urge and that temptation to sin. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.22, and we're almost done. We're, we're 32 minutes, we're almost done. Um, in fact, this is the last slide. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.22, Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, and with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So what should we flee from? Lust. We should um, flee from anything that would uh, cause us to sin. Um, you know, if it means turning off the TV, if it means getting rid of your computer uh, so that you don't have any, I mean, I know we have these electronic devices, um, that we can do pretty much anything on too. Um, but we need to turn away from lust, turn away from things uh, that cause us to sin, whether it's, um, you know, pride, the lust of life, the pride of life, um, the lust of the heart, anything that our heart desires pretty much, we need to turn away from it because it's evil, because our heart is deceitful above all things. The world these days would say, just follow your heart and do what your heart says. No, your heart's wrong. Your heart is a liar. Your heart's going to get you killed. Your heart is evil. We follow self. We follow our heart. We follow self. And that is selfishness that leads to pride that brings us death. If we follow God, if we, if we get rid of the lust and we follow God, that leads to life. And so what should we pursue? And with whom? We should pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart, with other believers, with other Christians. As believers, we need to avoid people in places that would cause us to stumble into sinning. If you like to drink, a bar is not a good place to go anytime uh, for any reason. It, it's not a good place to go. Um, so this involves turning away from sinful lifestyles and developing godly Christ-centered lifestyles. Uh, where we desire and thirst after the things of God. We literally have to change our lives and get to where we are focusing fully on God. You know, and one way to do that is if your church has some sort of a group um, or a Bible study uh, every day of the week, be there. 
be there with those people. Those are the people who call on the Lord. And with them, uh, you will build your righteousness, your faith, love, and peace. And um, you will be drawn closer to God. You will desire the things of God the more that you um, focus on him. That's it for this um, lesson. Um, next Sunday, come in next Sunday. Um, I will try to get it out on Sunday instead of Monday. Um, so here's some contact info. You can find me at soberchristian22 at gmail.com, www.soberforchrist.com. Like I said, on the website, um, there's also a contact link on the website. Um, but on the website, there's other videos, there's podcast, a uh, link to the podcast, the PDF files with, um, the lessons are there so that you can print them off. There's other videos on the website uh, because I do tend to go out and find other videos from other, um, you know, other pastors, other biblical pastors, uh, uh, biblical teachers uh, to put on, on my website. Um, it also has the information for the Zoom meeting. This same program, Tuesdays at 6.30 Mountain Time in the U.S., um, we host a Zoom meeting. The login information is all on the website. Um, and then as always, my email is there. You can find the contact information also on the website. If you uh, need prayer, if you need help finding a church, which you can find on the website, there is a church finder there along with some other resources. Um, but if you need prayer, need help finding a church, or if you would like to request a paper Bible, um, just send me an email and we will send you a paper Bible free of charge. I'm a big proponent and advocate for everyone having a paper Bible. Electronic devices are nice. Everyone has one. They fit in your pocket and you can take them everywhere with you. Problem is they come with um, distractions uh, because um, you get notifications on them. You get your emails, your text messages, and all of the social media in the world is on them. And if you have a uh, an addiction to social media, you will find yourself switching from reading to social media. And if you were to cal count all the time that uh, you spent in your Bible app on your phone versus the social media apps on your phone, you would spend, uh, you would find that you spend way much, uh, way more time uh, in uh, the social media apps. So um, again, that's it for this episode. Check out the website. You can find um, everything there. Um, that you would need for this, including, like I said, links to the Zoom meeting. So that'll be it for this episode, guys. Um, stay grounded, stay in God's word. And until next time, God bless and have a great night.